Cool. So I've been looking forward to this conversation, I think, for weeks now. Um, just, just for the people in the room, I'm Matt Beck. I'm Director of Investments at DCG. I've been in the space for um, about seven years now. And so I've seen a lot over the years. And um, I can confidently say that this is one of the periods of, of time in this market that I've been most fascinated and excited. And it's largely because uh, of some of the work that, that these guys who are up here are doing. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to just having kind of a, a wild and, and crazy conversation with you guys. We can take it in really any direction that you want. And I just love the opportunity that I get to sit up here with you for 45 minutes and, and pick your brains. Um, so maybe we can just kick it off with a, a couple uh, introductions and you guys can tell us about uh, what you're working on and um, the vision that you have for the protocols that you're, you're working on. Definitely. Well, hey, thank you guys for having me. My name is Robert Myers, um, otherwise known as Caro. That's my stage name. Um, you know, we, I, I'm an a engineer at, uh, on the Cortex team at OpenTensor, and we develop a, uh, the protocol called BitTensor. It's a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized protocol that enables artificial intelligence to learn from each other. We leverage two types of technologies. It's called mixtures of experts and distillation. Um, with distillation, uh, raise your hand. Uh, has anyone played with Midjourney V5? Yeah, yeah, pretty good, right? Pretty good. So, what's really cool about distillation is that what they had to do in order to create Midjourney V5 was they had 4K Hollywood movies that they trained on with the subtitles from those movies, collected, you know, incredible amount of data there. But with distillation, I can go get a thousand text image pairs from Midjourney V5 take a standard you know, uh, stable diffusion model, and then fine tune it on that, and boom, now I have Midjourney V5. This is one of the technologies that BitTensor heavily leverages um, with distillation um, through the network, through the prompting network, you can, you can create these data sets very easily. And we also leverage mixtures of experts by instead of having one large model, um, we have a bunch of different specialized models um, wired up kind of like a series in a battery, you know, wired up to where the voltage is higher. And uh, yeah, that's what, you know, something that we're working on right now is the BitTensor prompting network uh, with the, the Finney subnet. And uh, yeah, you know, we can maybe get in a little bit. I don't want to take too much. Uh, I want to give these guys a beautiful time uh, to talk as well, so. My name is Greg. I am the uh, founder CEO for Overclock Labs, and uh, we are the core developers for Akash Network. Akash is an open compute marketplace uh, for cloud-grade resources or you know, low-latency, high-performance compute. Um, the uh, crux of the system, I mean, most use case, the best use case is really secondary. Uh, market, so we have quite a lot of uh, data centers that have unused capacity that they can sell on a cash, and the advantage is you get, as a user, you get access to super low cost and uh, a wide variety of compute. It's especially great for GPUs, turns out GPUs are the new oil, so they are, if you ask anybody doing any decent amount of training or inference or fine tuning, uh, you'll, you'll notice GPUs are very hard to get. It turns out a lot of people are just buying up GPUs, you know, so especially the high-end ones or, or H100s, which is the latest and the greatest GPUs. Uh, Elon Musk purchased about 10,000 of them a few weeks ago, and that's going to be, that's going to be the thing, right? So these, this is the new gold. Uh, so now, if you have a lot of GPUs, where do you, what do you do with them? You can either use them for training or you can sell them on a secondary market on a cash. So uh, we think the future of uh, the way you, you, the only way you'll be able to access these GPUs in the future is going to be from each other. Because uh, right now you can't even, it's, it's impossible to get them, not even from cloud providers, unless you know someone very higher up, right? Uh, it's very, very hard to get these GPUs. So, uh, and we had, we, this, this marketplace is, is decentralized and permissionless and, and, and fully open source. I think if you think GPUs are going to be the power of the future, we need that to be uh, decentralized, and that's what we're working on. Awesome. Uh, my name is Harry Grieve. I'm the co-founder of Jensen. We're a deep learning computation protocol. So we focus entirely on training large neural networks. Um, similar to the other panelists, we do this in a peer-to-peer -peer way, so we connect up all the hardware. We like to kind of describe ourselves as sitting just above the electricity layer and really just coordinating electricity and hardware to build collective intelligence. Um, I think if I had to leave you with kind of three ideas from this panel. It's that 
decentralization unlocks free things that cloud oligopolists currently prevent people from having. One of them is true universal scale, being able to train a neural network at universal scale. So once we as a species like go beyond Earth, you know, being able to hook up all the devices everywhere in you know, human civilization for training models, number one. Number two, price. They price gouge up to a kind of order of about 70%. Uh, if you have a crypto network, you don't have to do that. And thirdly, computational liberty. If you have a permissionless protocol, you can train what you want with who you want. Kind of similar to the R weave points made earlier. You know, if someone wants to train something and someone wants to train it for them and there's economic, you know, agreement on the price level, that person should be able to train that thing. Cool. So you guys could be working on anything right now. You're clearly, you know, all very bright, brilliant people. Um, why, why is this the thing that you guys have decided to dedicate your time and efforts to? Like, I'd like to know that on both maybe uh, an opportunistic level, but also like more of a philosophical level. Like what makes you tick? What drives you to work here? Yeah, happy to go first. Um, for me personally, my background's in applied machine learning. So I used to build models which predicted the damage from wildfires and constantly came up against these issues of scaling, particularly with respect to compute. You know, there's a kind of adage that there's three things which determine model performance, you know, data, compute, and model architecture. There's an abundance of data, model architectures. There haven't been, you know, breakthroughs too substantial in, you know, recent years, although distributed mixtures of experts is a good one, um, for us to key kind of bottlenecks to computation. Um, and that's something that I felt, you know, trying to rent GPUs off of GCP and other places, it was just either painful or expensive. Um, so that was the kind of like, opportunistic thing. I saw this happening around 2019, quit my job and co-founded with uh, my co-founder Ben in 2020. Um, I guess kind of more philosophically, I think that, you know, intelligence isn't just kind of in here, it's, it's everywhere. And that by getting more kind of augmentation around intelligence, similar to the way that we kind of learn from people before us, you know, language and books and things like that, being able to kind of put more of our intelligence outside of our heads into other kind of beings is a way to basically push forward civilization. We do that today with Google. So instead of remembering things, we just let Google remember it for us and then we access that really kind of trivially for our phone. Eventually we'll just be thinking about it, it'll be connected straight through a BCI into a neural network and then our own organic neural networks will just be extended by, you know, I guess machines. Uh, my motivation, I, I believe the world should be open. I mean, I, uh, I, I'm a firm believer in open source. I, I've been an open source contributor for most part of my career. Uh, I, my career exists because of open source. I mean, I grew up in India uh, without access to a lot of closed source software because they were, I was priced out and just not available. So I grew up learning on open source and building open source software all my life. So I think that's, that's how the world should be. And cloud, as you know, is increasingly, uh, you know, getting important, right? The cloud infrastructure, a lot of, most workloads now run on the cloud. And uh, in seven years ago, when I was, I was doing quite a lot of work on Kubernetes and, and uh, container native infrastructure uh, since 2013 era, and I've noticed that, uh, and this was right about the time when cloud was getting prominence, uh, we were seeing an anti-pattern from open source. So a lot of closed source software that was offering, offered by unique cloud uh, providers that were getting a lot of prominence, right? So that's when we started uh, working on open source cloud and Kubernetes came about and, and Docker came about and all these new technologies that could finally commoditize compute in a, in a manner that doesn't really matter what cloud provider you're on, you'll be able to still have this sort of like flexibility. And then the idea really came about like, how can we leverage this set of open source software to create a cloud provider itself? So uh, that opportunity really came in, came in about uh, uh, of ever landscape where most compute in data centers is not used because you normally, when you have a data center, you want to have a peak capacity to address peak workloads. And so that was an opportunity for us to build a truly open source cloud. And today, Akash Network is a a network built by you know, hundreds of developers across the world. Uh, Overclock Labs is a company that built the initial version of the network, but uh, uh, I don't know if you saw the presentation earlier, but uh, now 90% of the pull requests come from outside Overclock Labs. So nine out of 10 pull requests, pull requests is how you merge code to your, to, to your uh, repositories, right? So 
Uh, we are a very open uh, organization. Uh, the, the company, Overclock Labs, has all our product meetings are fully out in the open. Uh, we've created a mechanism to not only like the, the software is decentralized and all that is great, but governance is all that is great. But really, if you pull enough layers and you really ask where the attack vectors are, it really comes down to who actually writes the software. And it was very critical for us to have that process of creating the roadmap be open itself. So uh, I think uh, we, we, we deserve an open role. And if you think about AI, and which AI is, is undoubtedly going to become the most important uh, you know, uh, technological shifts, right? Uh, that has ever happened to humanity, and, and we're increasingly seeing another pattern where you have open AI, which is not really an open open source at all. It's just the name is open AI. Increasingly, open AI taking dominance, um, sucking the air out of the open source AI movement, right? So I think for open source AI to exist, we need to to decentralize the access to that open source AI, and uh, that's our, our 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 mission to ensure that the access to the to the oil that runs AI is is uh, decentralized and uh, and open and accessible to anybody and not censored. Yeah. So um, when I was uh, uh, before I was working on BitTensor, um, I was uh, you know very much an entrepreneur. I always had that kind of knack in me. I really enjoyed building things that people used. Uh, the first app I ever built was like a Flappy Bird clone. That was a picture of my Latin teacher's face from freshman year of high school. This thing went viral in my high school. I mean, I had t we got 10,000 downloads. The seniors knew who I was. Uh, I, it, was it was amazing. I, I caught the bug for sure. And so I'd always continue, you know, trying to build different applications. And uh, when I was in college, you know, writing all of these essays, I mean, it was a chore. And so I was really interested, is there, there's got to be a better way, right? And so uh, I started working on this thing called Cowboy Computer. And... You know, I was trying to use my own language models because, you know, OpenAI was restricted at this time. GPT-3 was not, you know, you couldn't, you had to have special approval. And I, I thought that was a very ridiculous notion. And so while I was doom scrolling on GitHub looking for something that could solve my problem, I, I came across BitTensor. And it really solved, uh, the, or the idea really solved the, the problem I was having, which was this censorship by OpenAI. And so, uh, you know, the, the, Basically, what Cowboy would do is it would write your essays for you, it would go and, and search Google, find your sources. Essentially, what AutoGPT does today, um, you know, that was what I was building on Cowboy. And when I, you know, it was like November of 2020, and, you know, I joined the Discord, um, you know, it was introduced to Jake and Ola, um, you know, realized they were building something really cool and was like, okay, I'm going to drop everything I'm doing and start working on this because I, I don't think there's anything more important than open source decentralized AI. And the reason why is because if you think about, you know, who the gatekeepers are when it comes to, you know, whether it's, whether it's like Walmart, whether it's a, uh, you know, ExxonMobil, you know, the producers of, and then the, ultimately the marketplaces for goods and services, these are highly controlled, centralized places uh, where commerce occurs. And what I was realizing was that, you know, technology is inherently deflationary. It makes everything cheaper. And so if we're going to have people who have basically the ultimate tool, right, the Swiss army knife of any type of idea you can have, right, you know, this has to be something that is open and available to everyone who's trying to build something that maybe open AI is not going to be so much of a fan of, you know? And so uh, that really inspired me to, to, to continue moving, you know, working on BitTensor. And it's propelled us to the point where we are now with the prompting network, where if you have any type of, of, of API that uses open AI's API, there's a two line drop in replace to replace OpenAI's API with our API. And so, and, and all you need to have uh, is, is a, a BitTensor wallet right now. And you know, it'll hit our validator, we're, we're giving it away for free, so please go and use it. Uh, and and you know, that, it, that really, uh, seeing where we came from to where we are today um, is something that's really, really inspiring, so. Cool, so I, um, I think this is a great opportunity to shift towards the open versus closed AI system debate. And I think I know where Everyone on this stage stands, you know, we're, we're supportive of more open AI uh, infrastructure. Um, but what do, what do you guys think the biggest challenges are in, in terms of competing with uh, the incumbent closed AI systems like open AI? Um, 
it, it seems to me that you know they they have a first mover advantage. Perhaps there's some proprietary work that they've you know not kind of opened up to the world that they've been building into the system. So how do we actually like more practically think of creating an open AM, AI infrastructure that can accomplish the ultimate goal of like unseating open AI? I'd focus on one thing first, um, which is maybe in the spirit of the question, but slightly different. It's not technological, it's narrative wise. I think right now everyone who's on Twitter, everyone who's been kind of looking at this Hudikowski versus Sam Altman debate, everyone who's seen the open letter for kind of pausing all training runs, anyone who hasn't, basically there's a large movement um, of people who want training of large language models specifically uh, to stop. And it gained a lot of kind of, it captured a lot of public imagination uh, for two reasons, in my opinion. Number one, like every other thing which captures public imagination is quite extreme, like, you know, the, the kind of antidote to these problems as put forth by some of the proponents like Eliza are, you know, we should have missile strikes and rolled, and rolled the data centers, which is pretty bad if you're running, you know, decentralized hardware. <laughs> you don't want to get a missile strike, number one. And number two, fundamentally, the public just do not understand these models. You know, they're difficult enough to understand as a machine learning researcher or engineer. But moreover, if you're like a normal you know, person, like you just can't really, you know, you don't really have a seat at the table in the discussions. Um, I think we need a coordinated and substantial response to that um, from the more kind of, I hesitate to say accelerationist, because I don't like the idea of it being kind of, you know, a false dichotomy of like one side versus the other. But there needs to be a kind of proposal put forth by the open source community that these models are actually, you know, good and having them in the open actually makes them safer and allowing, you know, you know, 10 people in Silicon Valley to hold the keys to, you know, potentially a doom style event for Earth probably isn't actually a good thing. Um, so I guess I'd summarize, I think that owning the narrative and shaping it and being coordinated about it's critical. I think open source AI is very alive and well. It's just not getting the recognition chat GPT gets. Uh, and okay, from like training, look at, to really say, okay, GPT-4 is the latest and greatest model, whatever, right? Uh, and the reason, because they have two main advantages, open source AI doesn't, one is access to GPUs, and second is access to data, right? So uh, from a resources limitation, those are the two critical elements we need to solve in order for open source AI to thrive. Uh, but open source AI is, is very well. It's actually taking a diverge. It's, it's a little forked off from your chat GPT based AI. Uh, we're seeing models like, you know, uh, Llama, which is the Facebook's I mean, Meta's version of um, Meta's LLM. And there's a generative thing on top of it called Alpaca, right? With Stanford's uh, model trained on open AI data. So you can't really use that for commercial purposes, but, and similarly you had like GPT for all and, and, uh, uh, and, and another one that came from Databricks that's, that's very similar, right, to, to, to uh, ChatGPT. But I think it really comes down to, it comes down to like just recognition for these open source AIs, right? Like, and that's, that's, that's gonna be solved over time. And, and also if you think about it, if you're a company, you can move fast, right? Uh, but you can only move so much, you can move as further as you can with the community, right? So I think open source will eventually win out and it will, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time. And also, like, products haven't really caught up to how fast these models are moving. Like, GPT-4 is so advanced, pro this pr products are not yet being built for GPT-4. Like, they're still stuck in GPT-3, maybe 3.5, right? Um, and uh, by the time products really catch up to GPT-4, I think the open source will catch up to GPT-4, right? So, and when you're building products, you don't want to build, you don't just want to be a wrapper on top of GPT-4, open, sorry, on, on, on OpenAI. You want to have your own mode, and the way you get your own mode is to have your own embeddings, have your own like fine tuning, you know, have your own sort of like set, right? So I think uh, that only will come through open source AI. So I don't think, uh, the pattern that we normally see with, with products being built on uh, on these models is that yes, they go and plan and experiment with all the latest and the greatest. That's like uh, GPT-4, which is extremely slow, by the way, and extremely like, limited. And once they know, and once they iterate, once they know what they want, they move that to GPT-3.5, uh, GPT which you need a little more hackish on your on prompting, but, but ultimately, I don't think uh, 
no matter the advancements in the models are not going to be translated to actual results and actual usable things people are building. Uh, and uh, I think open source AI is going to be the future. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with these, uh, you know, with, the, with them, but, you know, also I think that the open AI or, or open source AI a real problem right now. And it's that investors of OpenAI uh, realize that OpenAI has no actual moat. It's not the model, because that can be very easily distilled. With GPT for all, uh, you know, what we've seen with Alpaca, th this can be distilled. So there is no data moat there, right? We recognize that a six billion that's fine-tuned on a specific downstream task outperforms even GPT-4, GPT-3.5 Turbo, outperforms all of it when it's fine-tuned, even at the smaller scale. So scale is not gonna win. So what the investors of OpenAI and, and maybe even the individuals at OpenAI have realized is the only way to build a real moat is to do regulatory capture, where they create laws such, such that where open source AI wouldn't even be able to exist. And I think that this is one of the biggest threats to open source AI right now. Not because of any type of fundamental technology, not because the applications are not getting adoption, but because the, 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 they were going to rely on the regulators to basically make it illegal to do open source AI in the name of alignment. Now, I would argue that anything that's done in public, we can all see and all verify together, is probably gonna be a better alignment solution than like what we were saying, individuals in Silicon Valley with no, who are unelected, who have no, who do not represent the interests of, of whether it's Americans or, or the international community. And as, you know, as a result of this, I think that if we continue heading down this way, uh, you know, it could end up very badly for, uh, you know, the individuals, right? Instead of, you know, we're open AI, it's a winner take all. And so, as a result of, of this, I think it's more important than ever that we try to decentralize this technology before it's too late. Once the cat's out of the bag, they can't stop us. And so, you know, th this is something that, you know, is, is something that we should really be focusing on as, a, 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 as the open source community. And I think why it's so important that the technologies that uh, myself and, and my, my co-host here are building is, is more important than ever. I just add to that that we've seen this happen with GDPR. You know, the only people that benefited from GDPR were big tech because it killed everybody else. No one could compete. No one can pay the legal fees. Um, it's happening again. And it's not just kind of theoretical. If you look at the um, EU Data Act, there are clauses in there which have been put in by people like OpenAI. I think it's the EU Data Act. It's one of them. OpenAI put in a data act which would abs you know, abscond itself from any legal kind of um, blowback for training LLMs. Um, people who have, are slightly, you know, who are closed and who are ahead of the game, uh, like OpenAI, can, can do this. Um, because they have that kind of first mover advantage and they want to basically pull the ladder up behind them. And as we saw with GDPR, it results in a, a hellscape for users. <laughs> nobody, likes the, uh, nobody likes the cookie pop-ups. Yeah, and so there's, you know, there's things like bias, regulatory capture, like these have huge implications down the line if they're not managed properly. And, and, and for me, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's about alternatives. It's not necessarily about like one system beating out the other, though that may happen, but it, it's certainly about alternatives. So in the same way that, you know, Bitcoin was an alternative form of money or store of value outside of the traditional financial system, and, you know, that has characteristics and pros and cons, and then there's the dollar, you know, which you can go up to a store and, and buy, you know, your groceries with, but it's stable, you know, that has pros and cons. But it, it's the idea that there's these alternative systems that people have the freedom and ability to opt into for different purposes that suit their needs. So I think that that's just, Super important to me. Um, what do you guys think are the biggest challenges for truly decentralized open AI to reach its potential and the vision that I think we all share? So, I, like I said, regulatory capture. I think that's coming down the pipe faster than we think. Um, you know, we have the we have uh, individuals who may or may not be invested in in open AI. They're, at least we know for sure they're invested in Microsoft, who stands to to gain so much from the already monopolistic powers they have through you know their Office 365 suite. You know, if you look at what happened to Slack, 
Uh, I mean, it, their business was, was decimated because of the monopolistic practices of Microsoft. And we're going to see that again with, with uh, OpenAI. OpenAI has no moat, like I was just saying. I mean, it, the, the data can be distilled. The scale is not going to ultimately, you know, be the thing that, like, if you can distill it down to a six billion, right, it's much cheaper to run that six billion. So, you know, they're going to get outcompeted on cost as a result, right? So the way that they're, the, the threats that I see coming down the pipe is, is regulatory, right? Not only are we experiencing regulatory scrutiny, um, you know, in the greater crypto field right now um, through, you know, maybe you could call it a PSYOP, you know, I, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it's, we're definitely seeing uh, movements towards, you know, the, the, the people who have money invested and have pl already placed their bets have already, are already seeing that OpenAI is not gonna be able to secure their moat because Alpaca came out like two days later after GPT-4 came out. And so in GPT-4, all this data set, you know, is, is a really incredible data set. If you guys haven't fine-tuned on it, I recommend you do, because um, it's, it's fantastic. And so um, I think that w the biggest threats that, uh, at least here in America, is gonna be that regulatory capture. But um, overall, I think that we're gonna, as a result of that, see other places flourish and, and utilize that uh, to their advantage. And so it sounds like to me what you're saying is that because there's no moat that ultimately these AI it's got to be open and intelligence will become commoditized exactly and so um, so can you talk a little bit more about okay in this world where you know AI and intelligence is commoditized um, um, basically you know why it's important to have kind of a decentralized open system like this yeah, so, you know, when you, have, when you have one person who's steering for all of us, right, let's call them the bus driver, you know, and they're driving erratically, you, could, you should be able to get up and say, hey, man, maybe don't go press on the gas too fast or don't take that turn so hard. But unfortunately, there is no accountability right now. All we can do is yell about it on Twitter, but how much, of, how much does that actually move the ball down the field? It doesn't. And so the reason why it's so important to ensure that we have decentralized AI and open source AI is not just so that we can all audit if it's safe or not. Not only can we audit what it was trained on and what it does, but we can leverage that in any way that we please. You know, if you have to sign up for a wait list to be able to use this API that you know, you can't build on your own because they are utilizing either regulatory capture or economies of scale, you know, by having these, this technology in the hands of everyone, I think that with the amount of progress and economic growth we will see as a result uh, is going to be, is much beneficial to our, you know, our, our children and our children's children. If a few people have the means, if, if a few people own the means of labor and the means of production, we move to a world of neo-feudalism where we have, um, you know, a few lords and a million serfs. This is not what, you know, at least uh, America was built upon. That was not the concept America was built on. That was not the concept that the Western world was built on. It was built on this idea of the individual being able to go out and, and build their own, own uh, businesses and be able to live their own life and make their own decisions for them. If we move towards a system of neo-feudalism, I think that it's gonna be very bad, maybe not for us, but for our kids and our grandkids. And uh, that's why open source AI and making sure that this is in the hands of everyone. Everyone has, the, uh, has access to this type of labor. You know, if, if labor goes to zero, because we're able to, you know, like intellectual labor, I mean, you, you know, now me augmented with the BitTensor prompting network when I'm doing my coding, like when I'm, when I'm writing code, I can write it 10 to 100 times faster. I become a thousand X engineer with this technology. And so the amount of work that I can get done is so much better, it's, it's so much faster. And, and as a result that if time is equal to money and I'm saving time, I'm saving money. Now if only a few people can access that technology, if only, if only the lords if only, you know, can access that technology, then that's not good for anybody, right, except for the lords. And so I think that us as the individuals, right, we should ask ourselves, do we want democracy or do we want tyranny? There's already a rumor that AGI is here and people are keeping it secret because you can do, make a lot of money. AGI means artificial general intelligence, right? So uh, when that happens, uh, 
it's going to be a new world. It's going to be a different world. It's not going to be the world that we, you and I know, right? Um, so it's very, very, very scary to think about the fact that there are going to be very few people that control it. You're already seeing right now with open, API, open, open AI API access, right? If you go to a hackathon in San Francisco, your biggest prize is API credits. That's more valuable than money. Access to API, open API, open AI API is more valuable than money right now. And we're already seeing that. And the question, and they can, if you say the wrong thing, a wrong prompt, you, your access gets cut. So one company, one man controlling that, right? Is that the future that you want? Or do you want a future where all of us uh, have a say in what we want to see and who should get access to the APIs, right? So, um, it's, it's, it's scarier as it is right now, but when, with AGI, uh, it's going to be even more scarier. And uh, I mean, it's going to be very obvious. Like if, I, if, if people that understand the value of AGI, uh, if they're built in, if they're going to keep it to themselves, there's no incentive for them to release it to the world, right? They can make a quite, there's, there's an amazing book, uh, an essay if I just forgot the actual author, but it talks about like how, what would happen if someone has access to AGI, right? They would not release it to the world, right? So that's really scary, and that's really scary. They could capture so much value uh, without, you know, without having to sell it for 20 bucks a pop or something, you know? So I would actually just underscore uh, yeah. Rob's yeah. point by saying, I think it's less like the people who, like an individual citizen person, like training a model, and more about giving you a the opportunity to like opt out of the kind of you know, neo feudalism as you mentioned, which I which I would agree with, um, or to basically to kind of like fight back. But I don't I don't think it's at the kind of I think it starts everything starts at the individual level. But I think it allows well financed and coordinated groups to actually push back because right now we're we're in a point where the number of like the fragmentation in the world is starting to look kind of similar to the Victorian era, you know, with like, you know, the British East India Company and stuff like that, where there's these kind of all powerful, almost like nation state level powerful entities. Microsoft would probably be the, the one which is the most in vogue right now, you know, with open AI, they are at the point where they are, you know, they, they're a law unto themselves essentially. And if they create AGI first, then they, they certainly are. Uh, that's the first thing I'd say. I say the second thing, just in the spur of the question, like what was the hardest thing? I'd actually say on a technical side, it's verifying um, deep learning training. Um, and that's specifically for two reasons. The first is neural networks, the way they've been designed today, are inherently probabilistic. Uh, so they don't kind of create outcomes which are deterministic across devices because we never had to. And as a result, if you want to use hashing, um, you know, to, to kind of confirm outputs and compare them similar to how, you know, Bitcoin works, uh, that doesn't work because a, a bit flipped in the wrong direction destroys a hash. Um, that's number one. And number two, they're very state dependent. So it's hard kind of to zoom in halfway through a neural network training run and say, okay, you know, I'm going to check that point on like a task like say rendering, where when you're rendering, you know, you can render the different bits of the screen and then zoom in on one area and it's independent of all the other areas and you can re-render it. With a neural network, you can't do that. You have to train the entire network up to that point and then check there. That's something that we've dedicated about two years to solving, um, mainly through cryptographic proofs and also through way, basically reproducibility research. How can you let neural networks train across different heterogeneous devices? I think allowing neural networks to train, not just on like an A100 or a V100, but on everything, including stuff like, you know, MacBook, um, M1 and M2 chips, also kind of more custom ASICs like graph or um, IPUs is essential because there's centralization happening at the kind of higher level of intelligence in terms of GPT-4, but there's also a huge amount of centralization happening lower down the stack in terms of the actual chips themselves. You know, and if you go be lower than the chip level to the fabrication level, then you're basically just at the five nanometer level, you're at basically TSMC in Taiwan, who are basically the only people who are building it. And the amount of centralization risk there is unparalleled. It's probably worse than open AI in my opinion. So what do we do about that? That's a hardware question, which is, hard, which is harder than uh, the software questions in my opinion, mainly because of the huge capital investments that you have to kind of, you have to you kind of outlay to, you know, if you're trying to build five nanometer sort of like wafers, like, you know, you're in 
<laughs> you're just, yeah, you're, you're, you're in a proper industrial factory. You know, it's, um, it's highly capital intensive. I think the answer, um, I think that, that's an answer. I don't have a, like a solid answer to how to deal with the hardware issue, but the way we can solve it at the software level at least is by having the ability to be agnostic to the overall chips. You know, the, the TSMC thing's like a geopolitical issue, but slightly higher up when it comes to like, okay, like, am I gonna be NVIDIA only? Am I gonna be AMD only? Will I work on a, you know, Google TPU pod? Can I work on an M1, M2 MacBook? Could I run a, a you know, neural network training job out of Tesla? Things like that. I think everything's gonna become more interconnected, number one, and number two, being able to train across all these devices um, is, gonna be, is gonna be critical to that. Cool, I think that's a fantastic answer. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think I, I see at the moment is you have an insane amount of innovation that's happening on the AI front. You have you know, new things that are happening every day. It's almost impossible for the human mind to process and keep up with. So there's a lot of people working on these types of problems. Um, how do we draw more of these engineers into kind of like the intersection of AI and Web3? Because I think a lot of um, kind of like the more traditional ML engineers, you know, they stay in almost like the Web2 version of ML, and they're a little bit more leery or like reluctant to get involved in some of the things that you guys are working on. So how do we, how do we sort of like draw them in? Do you guys have ideas about that? I think one of the best ways to do it is access. Like what we were just saying, you know, getting GPT-4 access is, is better than money, right? And so if we can give them something like that, give them that access, but in a permissionless way, um, I think that's really good. Okay, well, I have to wait two weeks and get approved, and my app's got to go through this, you know, seven safety people, and, and you know, it's totally not a... a uh, it's a, not a comp, it's not a, a it's not simple, it's not convenient. It's not a convenient process. It's not permissionless. And as a result, you know, it, I think that that really turns a lot of developers off from using that technology, right? And so if we can give them access uh, to this technology, I think that that's going to remedy this situation very greatly. And also, you know, I think that oh, I, I was, I was speaking earlier today, a lot of people don't even know this technology exists. And so if they don't know it's happening, then the only thing that takes up in their mind is, is something like ChatGPT. In fact, I, I saw something, I mean, anecdotally on Twitter, but it's, they were, we were, when they were, they had like an email bot and it was writing emails for them. And at the bottom, it was like written by AI. And they changed it to written by ChatGPT and the respondents went up by 11%. And so there was some, I think there's something to be said that OpenAI's ChatGPT has this really great brand with you know, the, let's just say the average individual. And so what we need to do is move or, or at least get into that space right there, this ability that, hey, you have better access, you have better options, it's much more fair you know, to the average individual than something like ChatGPT? Uh, access, right? So uh, one of the things that uh, Akash is launching GPUs very soon. We have them in test rent right now. We're onboarding providers. One of the things that we will be launching the mainnet is with H100s. Now, H100s are the top of the line GPUs. Uh, it's impossible to get them uh, from anyone. And we are able to secure them because people bought H100s and are holding on to them and they have no way to sell them except on a cash. So a decentralized system is actually helping them get liquidity on their you know, dead asset, right? Yeah. So a cash will be the only place for machine learning devs to get H100s, and H100s are like six times faster than A100s for certain use cases, right? Like, yeah. So giving like AI developers what they cannot get with the current centralized infrastructure will be the way to get Web3 people onto Akash. And I tried the other way. I went, I do a lot of hackathons and, you know, the, the hackathons today in San Francisco are, for AI especially, is it's just next level, right? Like if you're, on average, you see four to 500 people. The other day I went to a meetup, there were 5,000 developers at a meetup for AI meetup, right? So there's a lot of developers have no idea about what Web3 or what, what, you know, what we can offer. I tried to onboard a web, uh, in a Web3 a AI dev onto Akash, it was very, very hard. Because for them, when you say blockchain, it's about Bitcoin, right? Nobody, like, beyond Bitcoin, they have no idea what, what a blockchain is. And for them to, like, say you need to get a Kepler wallet and go on Cosmos, yada, yada, I mean, it's just, you know, it's not going to happen, right? So, but it will happen when you say you have H100s. 
because yeah. they will do the extra work to get on, do the, do the onboarding, right? Because that's a big barrier. So it really comes down to providing, uh, offering something that the market doesn't have. Uh, and what Web3 is really, really, really good at is sourcing supply, right? I mean, we can incentivize supply, we can do a lot of cool things. I mean, Web3 is really good at uh, unlocking network effects because it has this, this, this game mechanic primitives. Uh, that could be employed, right? So, and this like, uh, and that could essentially unlock large coordination uh, schemes. So, using that and offering a product that's compelling enough for uh, for AI devs in Web two, I think is is a way to go. And we are already starting to see a lot of like AI devs. Uh, if you walk down Hayes Valley and you say you have you have H one hundreds, you get kidnapped. Basically, it's it's serious, <laughs> right? Uh, we're already seeing like a lot of them like looking at Akash uh, for this very very uh, you know reason. Uh, some believe, some don't, but in the only way they'll believe is when we actually have them. So, I make a brief anti point, you know, which is everyone here is orange pilled to some extent, and everyone kind of gets it, and everyone's you know sure, but like the majority, as you said, of machine learning engineers do not get it and do not care and do not give a fuck about the philosophy and don't, like, they don't care if it's decentralized, they don't care if it's like censorship resistant, all they care about is product access, so like scale, but also price. Um, and one of the kind of trap doors which we've kind of like tiptoed around multiple times in our journey so far is lots of people saying, oh, you know, do like generative art for like NFTs or like do, you know, some wet, super like web free for web free or crypto, crypto for crypto type use case. I think something core is to be like crypto for everything else because, you know, 99.9999999% of the demand is out there. I think, you know, ultimately it will, it will flip and the majority of it will be in the kind of crypto uh, universe ultimately, but you know, right now it's not. So focusing and being very kind of like web two friendly, I think it's so, like one thing is like, you know, obviously we all use native tokens, but like being able to pay like in dollars is like an example, like, you know, meet them where they are. If someone has to buy like some coin, which you have to hold on their balance sheet to like use your product, like that's like. I mean, some people just can't even do that, right? There's just like an access issue immediately. So yeah, and that kind of anti-point would be that. No, I agree, like, I mean, I, I personal experience onboarding AI devs to Akash has been extremely painful, and a lot of them has to be like, okay, why do I have to buy your token? Like, yada, 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 right? So like, so making it super simple and having that fiat on-ramp is super helpful, but again, like, I don't, like, the, the challenge there is to how do you compromise between non-custodialness and custo you know, in custodial-based services, so, um, we are working very hard to keep it non-custodial as much as we can, so providing USDC payments, for example, but not just credit cards, or maybe working with other partners uh, that could provide us the I mean, credit card mechanisms to, to onboard. But, but yeah, so if ultimately it comes down to like the sweetness, right? H100's availability, I think, is going to get us there. Cool. So I think I have time for one more question for you guys. Um, what is the thing that's sitting in your brain, based on the work that you've been doing, that you're most excited about, um, that you wish you could kind of expose or reveal to this room? Like, what is, the, what is that one thing where you're like, oh man, if only people could see this? Yeah, so uh, something that, I mean, there's a lot of really great projects being built on BedSensor right now, um, utilizing the prompting API. Um, but something that, you know, we're really excited and we're gonna be pushing out in the next couple week, uh, weeks is our own pre-trained model. Um, we partnered with Cerebris to uh, uh, create a 2.7 billion uh, hyperparameter model that has an AK sequence length. This is gonna, it, it was also trained on 1.2 trillion tokens. So exactly like Llama, um, except it has an AK sequence length, which is you know, four times better than, than GPTJ. It's two times better than uh, stable LM. And what's really promising and exciting about this is that we're offering a bedrock for uh, people to be able to participate and get in with uh, a consumer grade uh, uh, hardware. So like a 4090, a 3090, that it fits in the VRAM um, and you can fine tune it down to any downstream task you like and then deploy that into BitTensor. So you can build your, you can, using the prompting network, 
you can go and create the fine-tuning data set, right? You take that fine-tuning data set, you fine-tune your own language model, you put that back up in there, uh, into the network, right? And then it just recursively, continually making it better. This is something that uh, is really exciting. You know, we'll have more updates and information over the next couple of weeks, but you know, stay tuned because it, we're, we're, we're almost finished, so. Amazing. I think the human experience is gonna totally change. And I think that kind of what it means to be human is going to completely change as well. So I kind of always go back to that idea of like how Google changed things for people where, you know, you don't necessarily, your memory is extended by the internet. You know, there are things on the internet that you can interface. You have kind of two interfaces. You've got like, you know, the physical interface, so like a laptop or a mobile phone. I and mean, then you've got the kind of, you know, the kind of search function, which would be like Google. And then it gets you the information. And that's an extension of your brain to some extent. Um, I think that that the power of that like extended faculty that we have is going to increase by orders of magnitude to a point where in the next five years the world will be completely unrecognizable. Like it would just be beyond our like wildest imagination. Um, and yeah, that's the thing I'm most excited about. I think like when I talk to developers, people don't realize we actually have a viable open source cloud. Like an open source cloud, right? So I think that's a big deal for me and a big deal for, I think, the world, right? Like, uh, and once people actually use Akash, then they realize and then they see the experience. And I think, um, and when they realize this open source cloud is not only just open source, but it's also non-custodial, it's permissionless, it's censorship resistant. It's a very, very powerful thing to have right, as, as a foundation uh, to, to build their applications on our software, right? So. For me, just like using Akash every day, I mean, it's, it's a few, very few free products that I actually use that are decentralized every day, right? Like I use Akash because I'm a developer, I, and I code and I deploy, right? So, um, and, uh, and, and, and it's just amazing. And now the, the fact that, uh, you know, now that you can actually run an alpaca on a fully decentralized network and uh, pay using a, you know, a, a token without giving your email address or anything. It's just it's another like sort of like amazing thing uh, for as, as someone working in AI, right? So it's like the open source is, is, is the, the world should be. Cool. Well, Harry, Greg, uh, Caro, it's been fantastic talking to you guys. Thank you guys for sharing your wisdom. And I'm sure this conversation will continue uh, probably hours into the evening um, with people around here. So thank you guys very much.